Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Miriam Rodella. I'm the director of the Center for Faculty Development, and I would like to welcome you to our 14th annual Nancy J. Tarbell, MD, Faculty Development Lecture. This lecture series is special, very special to our group and the CFD as it helps celebrate the importance of faculty development. And Dr. Nancy Tarbell, who is joining us today from Florida, she helped really shape the meaning of faculty development here at NGH, but also HMS and nationally and around the world. So we hold this lecture each year in May to coincide with Faculty Development Month. So we honor you all today. So now I would like to welcome Dr. David Brown, MGH president, to say a few words. Thank you, David, for supporting us here today. Thank you, Miriam. Welcome, everyone. I also am happy to, uh, to be part of the group that welcomes not only uh, all of you to Faculty Development Month, but also welcomes you to the Nancy Tarbell lecture. It's great to see Nancy. I haven't seen Nancy in some time in person, but I really am happy to see her on the on the Zoom. Most of you know that Nancy is a longtime member of the faculty at MGH in radiation oncology. Uh, she was the founding director of the Office for Women's Careers and the Center for Faculty Development. And then in uh, 2008, she left her leadership roles at MGH and went to uh, the medical school where she was the uh, vice dean for academic and clinical affairs and has had just an enormous impact on our faculty and faculty across HMS um, through her advocacy and commitment to uh, leadership, mentorship, and academic development. And so it's just wonderful that this lectureship is named for her, so appropriate, and uh, great to see her smiling face on this Zoom here. Now, of course, this is Faculty Development Month, but in, in my view, every month is Faculty Development Month at MGH uh, and the CFD under Miriam's leadership and with the support of so many of you uh, aspires to provide programs and seminars like the one today to really promote uh, leadership skills and career advancement for all of our faculty. So now I get the pleasure of introducing our featured speaker, whom I know well, and I think many of you do as well, Dr. Shannon Scott Bernaglia who's an assistant professor of pediatrics at HMS, the associate chief for clinical faculty development in the Department of Pediatrics here at MGH, and the director of the Office for Clinical Careers within the CFD at MGH. And if that wasn't enough, she's also a primary care pediatrician in the Mass General Hospital for Children's Pediatric Group Practice. She's also a trained coach through the Well Coaches School of Coaching, a medical educator who teaches, mentors, and inspires residents and students. Uh, serves on the HMS MSPE Writing Committee. Uh, she's a, PDA, a senior editor for New England Journal for Resident 360 and Knowledge Plus Educational Projects. And um, today she's going to speak to us about a really important issue about which uh, you know she is passionate, and that is vulnerability among our leaders and our mentors. She's been uh, really focused on physician leadership, physician mental health, and um, and I think that this topic is really right on target for what we need from our leaders today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shannon Scott Bernaglia. Thank you so much, my goodness. What a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'm gonna keep just looking right at Nancy's smiling face the whole time to kind of get me through the beginning jitters. I know in about five minutes, it's all gonna be okay. <laughs> Um, can somebody give me a thumbs up that they can see my slides? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Miriam, and thank you, David, for the incredibly kind um, introduction. I'm so very happy um, to be here today um, and really um, to be a part of the Center for Faculty Development that Miriam has created um, in kind of advanced um, from Nancy's time has been just such a privilege. Today I'm going to talk about vulnerability, and I chose this photo not just because I'm a pediatrician who loves pictures of cute young children, especially my own uh, picture here, but because we all come into this world vulnerable, like that little baby who's like doesn't have much choice to be vulnerable as her big sister hangs on to her um, and doesn't topple off the couch. And so in the spirit of sharing our humanity and our vulnerability, I would invite anybody who's willing to consider turning off your video for turning on your video, excuse me, for at least even part of this to kind of like share community with one another, even if you're eating your lunch, just helping us to see each other as fellow humans. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, but I will say that you'll see pictures of photos, and I don't want anybody to panic. The photos are, of my children have been approved by them, and of other people's children have been approved by their parents. Um, 
Here are my objectives, but my overarching goal for today is for us to leave with the desire to come to our work, to show up here even more authentically than we did yesterday, and more willing to be wholehearted in our work and in our humanity that we bring to the work that we do here. In the tradition of the HMS Academy, I thought I would start with a poem. And this is one that was um, shared with me by Rob Meyer many years ago now, but has always spoken to my heart. It's by William Ayotte and it's called The Contract, A Word from the Lead. And in the end, we follow them, not because we are paid, not because we might see some advantage, not because of the things they have accomplished, and not even because of the dreams that they dream, but simply because of who they are. The man, the woman, the leader, the boss, standing up there when the wave hits the rock, passing out faith and confidence like life jackets, knowing the currents, holding the doubts, imagining the delights and terrors of every landfall, captain, pirate, and parent by turns, the bearer of our countless hopes and expectations. We give them our trust, we give them our effort. What we ask for in return is that they stay true. I'd like to invite folks in the chat to just share with one another, and we won't spend a lot of time here, but if there's words or phrase, something that comes, you know, draws at your heart from this um, poem, just pop it in the chat so that, you know, it's there and people can look at it, in part to kind of keep you focused and like here with me, um, and in part because I think poems speak to each of us in different ways, and there are probably different words or phrases that come to different um, people in the audience today. As I hope desperately that there starts to pop up things in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and um, <clears throat> and transition to my next slide while I see folks um, putting lovely um, notes there. I'll pause for a second so you can still see the poem. Uh, <clears throat> Love it. Thank you so much. Feel better already. Feel like I'm now here among friends. <laughs> So let me say one or two more words about Dr. Nancy Tarbell. I came to the MGH as an intern, a very vulnerable time in one's training, two years after Dr. Tarbell had started the pediatric uh, radiation oncology program here. So whether or not we have crossed our paths directly in these many years, as often as perhaps my oncology colleagues have or not, she has always been an inspiration to me and somebody to look up to and to be here speaking in a named lecture in her honor is just an incredible honor and really a quite high bar um, to, um, to be asked to, to meet. Um, one thing in preparing for this talk that I loved is in several interviews, Nancy told, tells a great origin story about coming to medicine where a college friend apparently was the first person to see her as a physician to really encourage her to kind of think about pursuing medicine even when maybe she wasn't quite there yet up to the point of even like setting up a meeting that kind of led to Nancy going to medical school. And for me, when somebody that accomplished is being interviewed, to choose to tell that kind of an origin story, maybe from a time when they didn't know this is where they were headed, is the kind of vulnerability that I wanna to bring to the table today and for us to think about. So I also wanna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a primary care pediatrician. What I love most about the world I live in, in my clinical practice, is the chance to be a part of patient family lives, to kind of be a gentle guide in that um, journey. As um, David said, I'm a medical educator, which is a very parallel path of guiding people at a vulnerable time in their lives through training. And outside of medicine, I love to cook, I love to bake, and I love to garden, and I love children's books. I love stories in general. I love words. And you'll see our little free library um, up on the corner there. Um, and the joy of my life is my extended family, but especially my, um, my home home family. And so um, a huge shout out to my husband, Brian, my children, Marina and Rebecca, who fill my life with passion, laughter and love. I also right up front want to take a moment to acknowledge my privilege as the white, cisgendered, straight woman. As such, I have not faced racism day in and day out as our BIPOC colleagues and patients have to. When I come today to speak about vulnerability, 
Sure, I speak as a human being who's going to make mistakes and it's going to be hard, but I know that it's easier for me to embrace vulnerability because I haven't been consistently marginalized my whole life. So I call all of us who come into this world with more privilege given to us without having even earned it to be the first to show up, to lead authentically and to engage in vulnerability. I should also say that while this is a topic I care deeply about and which I work hard to embody, these are concepts that many speak about, write about, and research about. And in certain slides, you'll see I've credited specific work, but there's a whole body of work and I'm happy to share um, a longer uh, reading list with you. All of that is to basically say that if you came here for the leading research expert on the topic, I'm sad to say I'm not Brene Brown. I don't have her cool accent. But I understand why you might have gotten us confused, because it turns out we both have these like TEDx talks out there in the world that talk about vulnerability. Maybe just a few more people have seen one than the other. Uh, but if you're here at MGH, I welcome you to also uh, watch the one uh, here of mine. So let's start by thinking about what it means to be vulnerable. My family will tell you that I love the dictionary, um, and I kind of live by the Merriam-Webster word of the day. But frequently in the middle of a conversation, I'll also want to pull up the app and kind of think about the nuance of a word, a word that we all understand, but like maybe there's a different meaning to. And so here's the definition from Merriam-Webster of vulnerability. It's pretty scary, right? There's this thing to vulnerability that puts us at risk, that makes us open, to having something negative happen. But for the exact same reason I love the dictionary, the third definition for somebody who does not play bridge, so knew nothing about this term in bridge, is one that is really beautiful to me. Because it turns out in bridge, if you are vulnerable, you have risk, like all forms of vulnerability, but you're also open to rewards and bonuses by having played this in the game. And that's what I want to think about today, that there are real risks and incredible rewards to be um, reaped by being vulnerable with one another. But it isn't what we do all the time. It isn't what we naturally do as human beings um, as we get older. I would argue children are much more open to this. What instead we do in life, in medicine, in academia, is we wear masks all the time. We keep our vulnerabilities hidden Beside a fa facade, maybe it's Thor, but maybe it's the facade of an accomplished academic. We hide our inner insecurities, our uncertainties, our failures, our missteps. In fact, we may avoid our growth edge to stay in the safe zone of our prior accomplishments. And we do this in our everyday life too. Think about how we present our lives on social media. We're enculturated to hide our most vulnerable moments and instead show the smiles of Facebook and Instagram. We don't show the video that happened right after this photo, we didn't take a video, um, of my husband and I bawling as we drove home from leaving our firstborn at college. The real memory from that day is much more that than these smiling faces, although after a very successful year, I think we're genuinely smiling now. And so by wearing those masks and not choosing to be vulnerable, we can miss out on a lot of things. In this great poem by the children's poet Shel Silverstein, he writes about masks. She had blue skin, and so did he. He kept it hid, and so did she. They searched for blue their whole life through, then passed right by and never knew. That lost opportunity to meet the other blue person, that other person who might truly understand us, or more importantly, that student, resident, postdoc, or junior colleague, the one who's been told explicitly or implicitly that they have to wear a mask in this world to succeed. If we take our masks off for them as mentors and leaders, we're gonna allow them to see us as we really are and hopefully inspire them to show up as they really are. Now, I'm sure there are skeptics in the crowd I'm hoping that they're all multitasking and checking their email right now and not paying attention anyway. But let me be clear, when I talk about vulnerability, I don't mean the Jerry Springer show, that 30 year run of a show that really, you know, peddled in shaming and public airing of dirty laundry, in many ways capitalizing on our innate fear of being vulnerable. That's not what I'm talking about. This isn't reality TV. 
I'm not talking about dumping our entire lives on others, but rather sharing vulnerability with intention, with purpose, and with appropriate boundaries. But even still, why do we do that? Why cultivate this sense of vulnerability? Well, I've come to understand over time that no matter how internally vulnerable, unsure, or afraid we are that we're about to be found out as frauds, those around us, our mentees, our learners, our teams, they often just see our accomplishments, our triumphs, our titles, our wins. They see us on this pedestal because as humans, we put our own mentors up on these pedestals. So as mentors, it's our job to remember that even though we know what it took to get there, we have to cultivate vulnerability to share the struggles, the setbacks, the failures, the do-overs. So our mentees may not only see the result, the papers, the promotions, the awards, the titles, but to see what it took to get there. Because it's not always a straight line. It's not a straight line from the day I graduated from medical school till today when I'm honored with the chance to give a named lecture. It's not straight. And yet we often have created these narratives that make it sound straight. To really invest in mentee-centered growth and coaching, I think we have to talk about the messy fact that it's literally a curvy board that's littered with cherry pitfalls and that kind of menacing Lord Licorice down there. We need to create narratives of growth and accomplishments, not like we saw the board all laid out from the beginning, but rather that we tried our best as humans to make the best decision in this moment with the information I had. It led to this next step and then this next step when I did the same thing again. And I think when we do that, it allows those behind us when they encounter their molasses swamps to have more faith in themselves that they too are gonna to get to the other side of whatever that setback is. And I'm gonna now tell you a vignette. I have several through the talk and you'll know they're coming because they all have these kind of purple slides because I've been talking to some junior colleagues, asking them for examples of times where a leader or mentor um, showed vulnerability. And a first year resident shared with me that in the beginning of intern year, she was really struggling. It was just so hard, she felt overwhelmed. As an international medical graduate whose first language was not English, she worried that perhaps those were the reasons it was hard. She worried about whether this was the right place for her. In speaking to a trusted research mentor she had before coming to residency, her research mentor didn't just say it's gonna get better, but instead shared her own experience, talked about how early in her intern year, it was really hard, how there were times when she wanted to give up. There were times when she didn't think she had what it took. And that expression of vulnerability left this first year resident with this beautiful takeaway, not only normalizing her feelings, but giving her this hope and this vision that she was also gonna get through it. And I think that speaks to what Carol Dweck calls the power of yet. Carol Dweck is the person who you know, has written extensively about the growth mindset. And this idea that when we embrace yet, it's not that I have failed, it's that I haven't succeeded at this yet. I haven't conquered this yet. And let's face it, all learning requires yet, and it requires vulnerability. We have to take risks to grow and to learn. And so we have to create environments where that is okay and safe to do. You already know by now that in my house, we love books and words. The book on the left was a series of books that my mom bought for me from the grocery store each week at the, at, when I was little. And my children also embraced and loved. And this one story is one that my older daughter, we heard one day reading to my younger daughter when she was a fairly new reader. And it turns out that some of the words in this story she had learned from context in reading, but had never really heard us say out loud. So when she read this book about Bert and Ernie to her sister, she talked about the pearls of Penelope, just like a beautiful pearl necklace, because she'd never heard the word peril said out loud. She had learned, she was vulnerable, she made a mistake, but it was all in the kind of beauty of learning. Her younger sister, who's always loved to kind of play with words and gets them close sometimes, but not always, um, used to talk about this discount hair salon nearby as the hair cutlery. 
Now, for me, there's nothing in that that doesn't speak of the Little Mermaid combing her hair with a beautiful fork, um, the cutlery for doing hair. Just nice examples to remind us that we really are learning all the time as children, and it's just a natural part of what we do. It's what we do every day, and yet I'm not sure that we always show our learners at this stage in our careers what we're doing to keep learning and how we're doing that. We tout lifelong learning all the time, but do we show people the chisel marks, the mistakes, the places we had to like regroup and start over to go from the unfinished sculpture to the fully finished sculpture? I'm not sure that we do. Two authors from um, Australia, Margaret Bierman and Elizabeth Molloy, have two great articles on the importance of vulnerability and credibility and the tension between the two um, in the realm of medical education. They talk about this push-pull and they propose a concept of what they later call intellectual candor as a way to kind of open space for our learners to see us as vulnerable because we keep putting them out vulnerably. We ask them to tell us what they think is going on even though they don't have the years of experience we have. They ask, we ask so much of them and yet we often hide our own uncertainties um, in front of our trainees. I love in their first article that they call this before switching to intellectual candor, intellectual streaking. Because who doesn't love a half-naked toddler running across the room, streaking across the room? But what they call on us to do is to streak in front of our learners, to lay bare some of the things we're uncertain about, our deficits, the, the kind of things that are keeping us up at night. It puts us at risk for sure, but it's in that kind of risk that our learners then invest in us and really feel that now it's safe for them to also you know, be uncertain and share the parts that they're uncertain about. They actually give us in this article canned phrases to try. And so I put them up here. You can screenshot it if you want or pull their articles. Um, pick one even. I tend to really like the one about, I don't quite understand this yet, but this is what I'm thinking because it reminds me of the fact that as experts, we rarely talk through our thinking. We are much more likely to jump from presentation of the patient to what we think is going on. And it's actually more junior folks who can walk through their clinical decision making. So when we're uncertain, talking about how we're thinking about that, I think is a beautiful gift to those that we're teaching. No matter whether it's in a teaching environment or a mentoring environment, what we know is that vulnerability is a signal for trust. It helps others feel trust in us because they know that we're being honest with them. And I think that that is a great place and a great argument to start from. In our next um, vignette from a junior colleague, one of the psychologists I work with in my practice, who's really just wonderful, told me about a supervision group when she was in her postdoc. And in this supervision group, a senior um, faculty member was there to supervise, to talk through cases that the postdocs had seen, especially ones that they were finding particularly challenging. In this particular case, though, the senior mentor didn't just listen and comment on the cases the postdocs brought, but also shared with the group their own cases that they found challenging that were really emotionally difficult. And you know what? This is what that young psychologist took away from that a sense that it was okay and that it was hard for everybody because that normalizes this feeling of, oh my gosh, am I supposed to have this all figured out? Is this easy for other people? And as we think about those ways um, to mentor people, one of the things I like to think about is the fact that our goal really as mentors is to help our mentees find their place in the universe. Find the place where they shine brightly. Help them to see that they're shining brightly because so often they don't see it themselves. And that takes a certain amount of vulnerability on the part of the mentor as well. We have to avoid consciously or unconsciously mentoring toward cloning. We need to recognize that our path is not the only right one. And this can be hard for mentors because when mentees embrace different directions for their careers, 
it can lead to someone feeling rejected or that it's a statement about my career that this mentee doesn't want to go in the same direction. So we need to show up vulnerably and authentically as mentors in order to help our mentees find the ladder and climb the ladder of their choice. And I, I stole this fantastic phrase from someone on Twitter with their permission, because I love this idea that there are all these ladders and helping our mentees climb the ladder of their choice. It doesn't have to be my ladder, it needs to be their ladder. And I think these are a huge way that we help our mentees follow their values and find what brings them the most joy. And it's our job to help them flourish in that area, even if our values are what bring us joy might be different. And speaking of flourishing, as you already know, I kind of have a thing about the dictionary. And last month, Miriam Webster had a word of the day that perhaps at first glance, I either thought was spelled incorrectly or made me think about the time we went kayaking on a bioluminescent bay in Puerto Rico. But there's a you missing from this word because in fact, this was a new word for me. It's a noun, and it's a noun that relates to the concept of flourishing. It is about being in a state or period of flourishing, the place we all want to be in our careers and we want our mentees to be. It's my belief that when we are showing up as our authentic selves and working to support those we mentor to show up that way themselves, we are bound to end up in fluorescence. And it's just such a beautiful picture for me, I think because I still see that bioluminescent bay. I've struggled to find the original work to attribute this next quote from Steven Spielberg, but heck, even if this is urban legend, I'm going to share it because I just love this idea that our job is to delicately balancing mentoring so that we're not creating people in our own image, but giving them an opportunity to create themselves. And that as they create themselves, as their own fantastic selves, we or are open to that being different and better than what we did in a different way. We also need to be open and vulnerable that it takes a web of mentorship for those we mentor. And it's not the mentor who's the spider in the center, it's our mentee. And we're just part of the web that they need to succeed and move forward. And I love the sense that we need to be humble and show humility that we can offer certain things, but there are going to be others in their lives who are going to offer different things. One of the ways I've long thought about mentorship is that each of us as mentors is a different wall for a, someone to throw their ball against. And because we're different, we're made of different materials, the balls come back to that person in different ways. So they gain different insights from each of those conversations. So I invite you to not be afraid to be one of many, but in fact, to introduce your mentees to more and more mentors for their life. Because in the end, the very best mentors are just humans who chose to come out from behind the curtain to share their own vulnerability and in so doing to help their mentees realize what was always inside them, the brains, the heart, the courage, and the way home. In our next example from a junior colleague, I'm going to tell you about a resident who shared with me a really poignant story. As a student, he was openly crying in the ICU as a patient of his was wheeled out of the unit for organ donation. Shortly afterward, the attending found him to share that she also was sometimes moved to tears about patients. And then she also shared some strategies that she used to cope with these kind of moments. The resident now years later recalled the story telling me about it and talked about it not only normalizing his reaction, but providing inspiration to be the kind of doctor he wanted to be. This story, in my mind, epitomizes this concept from Johnson and Ridley's book about mentoring, that authentic self-disclosure can lead to really poignant learning and meaningful change. I would argue that as a student crying in the ICU, that's a potentially dangerous moment to feel a lot of shame and go into a shame spiral. And yet this faculty mentor came and changed the trajectory of that experience to be a really powerful and positive learning experience. I do want to talk a little bit also about mentoring across differences. The reality of medicine is that senior mentors still are disproportionately cisgendered straight white men and all of our junior colleagues 
deserve mentorship and sponsorship, and we need to all own that together. And we need to support and celebrate our minoritized colleagues who wish to mentor, but we cannot drown them and overburden them with an expectation to mentor all of those coming up through the ranks who may have similar backgrounds or experiences. And additionally, as we practice vulnerability, we need to recognize that what it means for me as a white woman to be vulnerable is different than what it might mean for my mentee who comes from a minoritized group, who may have spent their life being expected to work twice as hard, to act twice as professionally, just to be treated the same way that I am. In one of my favorite children's books, a little crayon named Red makes strawberries, but red strawberries don't quite look like his, their friend Scarlet strawberries. Red's experience may match that of some of our mentees, the recurrent experience that some folks have had of being underestimated and undervalued due to racism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, and that's going to make being vulnerable for them much harder. As a mentor, we need to show up authentically, fully, and vulnerably without requiring additional vulnerability from our mentees, simply showing up and creating that space. And in the end, we need to mentor across our different backgrounds. We just need to do so with care and compassion. And Kyle Castling and colleagues wrote a paper using a neat analogy about Athena, who in the Odyssey disguises herself as mentor to provide guidance to Telemachus. So basically across differences. And these authors recommend in this piece of their paper that we develop flexible mentoring practices, that we actively seek out the opportunities to mentor diverse mentees, because that's how we're going to build our skills, and that we should be avoiding only pairing like with like. It doesn't mean we don't also do that, but that we really need to be able to kind of think about that web of mentorship. For those who want to do more work in this space, Nora Osman and Bobby Gottlieb at the Brigham have done a lot of work in developing mentors with specific sessions on mentoring across differences, and their work is both in MedEd Portal and on their website. In the same kind of vein, two professors from Smith wrote just this year about mentorship in a specific group, BIPOC sports psychologist, and mentoring this group. But in it, they provide guidance that's really relevant for all of us using a model from therapy called broaching. And they call upon us to name and highlight, not to just pretend there isn't this difference, but rather to start our mentoring relationships by talking about the differences so that there's an open space to talk about when that might become hard. They remind us to explicitly ask and not assume how our mentees would like us to support them, to stand up for them, to speak out for them. And then, based on those preferences, to think about how we lift up their voice, how we speak out if they experience racism or misogyny, et cetera. And also an important reminder to check in after major events in this world that may impact certain groups even more so than others. I think if you take one thing away about this piece of mentoring, whether similar or um, across differences, is the importance of being curious just like probably no one who knows me knew they would, thought they would get away without a book, there was always going to be a Ted Lasso reference. Um, this idea to be curious and not judgmental is an amazing way in my mind to come at trying to understand our mentees' experience. We can ask questions from a place of learning and curiosity. We can listen deeply and with intention. And we can be open to making mistakes, being corrected and taught by our mentees. So be curious as we learn about them. And also we mentioned boundaries in general, but I wanna be extra clear that boundaries and consistent boundaries are really important. If for example, you are a mentor who is a man mentoring a woman, you might naturally and appropriately think that probably inviting her out for drinks to talk about her career might not be the right move. And yet it's just as important that you don't invite other mentees out for drinks to talk about their career because you've now closed off an opportunity for one group of mentees. So thinking about what you're doing and having it be consistent for your whole group of mentees and that you're being thoughtful about the places into which you're inviting your mentees, um, that that's an equal um, opportunity for all. 
I'd like to shift now to think a little bit about leadership per se. And in this, I'm thinking about leaders, big and small, organizational leaders, program leaders, micro environment leaders in a practice or a unit, family leaders like these parent swans on either end of their little swan babies. So let's start with the story of the little blue truck. In the beginning of this story, the little blue truck is seen driving around the farm, greeting animals and investing in getting to know them. Shortly after that, a big, powerful leader dump truck comes barreling through and proclaims, I have big, important things to do. I haven't got time to pass the day with every duck along the way. But when that dump truck gets stuck, none of the animals come to help him. The little blue truck comes to help him, and then he gets stuck too. And it isn't until our friend, the little blue truck, who has built relationships as a quiet, vulnerable leader, cries out, help, 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 I'm stuck, I'm stuck, that all of the animals gather together to get both trucks out of the mud. It was that vulnerable leader, the little blue truck, the humble leader, who inspired others to do something really hard, to push two trucks out of the mud. Teams want to follow vulnerable leaders who show humility. And that concept of humility is key for leaders. And who doesn't want to embrace the crest of human excellence between arrogance and lowliness? My goodness, like just that quote alone, I just want to be that. And humility is so tightly connected to vulnerability, it requires much of the same things of us. To view ourselves accurately without arrogance or bravado, to truly appreciate what those others bring to the table, those other farm animals, what did they bring to the table? and to be open to learning and growing ourselves through feedback. As leaders, vulnerability and humility become the foundational building blocks for building trust, that capstone that's so important. If leaders don't engender trust in their from their teams, their leadership is bound to fail. Because when things get hard, when we get stuck in the mud and we're asking a great deal of our teams and our community, they need to trust us as leaders in order to follow us into danger. A truly magnificent lead example of this type of leadership throughout her six years as New Zealand's Prime Minister is Jacinda Ahern, Arden, excuse me. There are many ways in which she shared her humanity and vulnerability in her role, not the least of which was choosing to take maternity leave in the very first year of her time as Prime Minister. But it was perhaps the tragedy of the racist murders carried out in a mosque in Christ Church in 2019 that stand out most. At that time, she led her nation, first in grief and sadness, and then in action. Because after that, within a week of the shootings, New Zealand passed the comprehensive gun reform that they had worked 20 years and hadn't been able to do. The photographer who captured this iconic image actually arrived late to the service that was happening and was on the other side of a glass window and took this picture and captured through that window this humanity of a prime minister being with her neighbors, listening, concerned, loving her neighbors as a leader. And that humanity, her willingness to be vulnerable right there as a neighbor, is an example of this tremendous vulnerable leadership in the poem we looked at at the beginning. The waves were hitting the rocks. She was holding their doubts. She was imagining this future where guns weren't going to be as dangerous in her country and the terror that everybody was feeling right then. She was bearing their countless hopes and expectations with them. Just a beautiful you know, kind of person and leader. Um, I think if you haven't heard or read her um, recent speech stepping down from that position. It is also a beautiful one. I almost included that. If we move to a study, um, Coda Ferris and Grant, who are two business professors who are interested in organizational leadership, they showed why leaders should take their teams, what they called behind the curtain, into the space of vulner vulnerability. And they based their work on a premise that they thought judgments about a leader's trustworthiness we're likely heavily playing into what playing into the trust of the organization and how those leaders disclose things about themselves. In their work, they asked leaders either 
to ask for feedback from their teams. We all encourage people to do that. Or to actually share the feedback with their teams that they had received. Talk about the things that they were working on that they weren't great at yet. Initially, on the left, the leaders who shared their feedback found it pretty hard. And frankly, their teams kind of found it surprising because it wasn't what they were used to. But over time, those same leaders really started to kind of commit to vulnerability. And once this became like not something that was just a one-time weird thing, interestingly, the employees, the team members, started to also be vulnerable. They found it safe to share new, brave ideas, to risk failure. This built psychological safety and over time crystallized into a cultural shift for these companies. And what they found in one part of the study was that this didn't change how the leaders were seen in terms of their credibility. There were no hits to their reputations. They were seen as just as great leaders as the people who didn't share the things that they weren't doing as well and were working on. And so if we think about it, isn't this what we want? We want learning and growth, which are built and born from taking risks from our teams. But nobody's going to take those risks if they're too afraid, if they haven't seen modeled for them that it's OK to take risks. Unless we think that this only applies in business, I recently was with a group of Harvard College first year students, and I asked them if they had any experience with a leader being vulnerable. One immediately said, oh, Dean Karana. Dean Karana, it turns out, Dean of the undergraduate college, is kind of famous, maybe infamous, for his Instagram feed. Each day, he posts multiple pictures of undergraduates living their life, studying, playing in the yard, just like he's there wanting to capture their lives. But this student was remembering hundreds of posts ago, many, many months ago, when Dean Karana had posted what he called a resume of failures and setbacks. He wrote about where he didn't get in to PhD programs. And by sharing things like that, these setbacks in his career from his position of clear power and leadership and accomplishment, he demonstrated for this first year college student a sense of what we call confident vulnerability. He disclosed his developmental journey. Other ways that you can demonstrate this are to use a language of learning and to show moral humility, to basically stand up for what is right, be anti-racist, own your own mistakes. In another example from um, a junior colleague, a research assistant shared with me that her research leader, a leader in the field he was speaking about, gave a talk at the Mayo Clinic that she attended by Zoom. Moments after the talk ended, her leader called her because he wanted to get feedback specifically on the things he was working on that he hoped he had done better job in this presentation than in the last one. And by asking for that feedback, he showed what it meant to use the language of learning, to make it clear that we are all learning all the time. And if we think about the third part, which was around owning our mistakes, one of my own first forays into intentional sharing of vulnerability was around talking about medical mistakes. As an associate residency director and then later as the residency director, I created a session for our residents each year that had these objectives. In it, I share mistakes that I've made over time in my career. But I always pay attention to not only share at least one example that was from when I was kind of in their shoes and their level of training, but more importantly, to share something that was recent. Because you know what? Vulnerability is a lot easier when it's in the past, back then when I was learning. It's a lot harder when it's right here, right now, I screwed up last month. I think about this when I think about my TEDx talk. When I wrote the paper that led to that, I was in a really good place. I was in recovery from my depression. When I gave that talk, I was in a pretty anxious period of time. And I thought, I can't do this. I'm too anxious, right? It's harder to get there and show up when you're in the middle of it, but it's all the more meaningful. And you'll see I'm very sweaty if you watch that talk because of that reason. Um, in creating this space for shared vulnerability in the session that I lead, what I am always amazed to see, but now it's so obvious why, is how quickly 
the residents that are able and open to sharing with each other their own mistakes, to learn together. And I've even given this talk to another department where I didn't come in knowing people, but I went and met each person as they walked into the room. And again, when you open up the space for vulnerability by being vulnerable, they also responded in an incredible way. Another example is how my friend, many of you may know, Dr. Dan Sadawi Kanefka, how he starts his orientation to anesthesia residents, talking about a young patient who died tragically during his fellowship. He shares openly about feeling gutted, and that is his word from this beautiful piece by this event, not knowing how to process it. He wants to create space for the next generation of anesthesiologists to feel able to process their own experience, and he does that by role modeling vulnerability as a leader. Most recently, like it or not, we have all faced serious vulnerability in the form of the COVID pandemic. For me, leading our pediatric residents through the personal and professional challenges of the first phase of the pandemic, where our incredible trainees who are pediatricians became the responding clinicians for adults dying of COVID in our repurposed ICU and inpatient unit was one that required authentic vulnerability. There was no roadmap. Simple reassurance in my mind would have been hollow and inappropriate. Multiple nights a week, we would gather on Zooms like this one in the bottom to create community, to share our fears, and it was a time for me as a leader to just listen. I got lots wrong in the early days, but I remain proud that I showed up, that I didn't hide that I was uncertain, afraid, I didn't pretend I had answers to all the questions. Frankly, I didn't have answers to most of the questions. But I think as we navigate this current time of uncertainty in healthcare, because there's a, clearly a time of uncertainty, this is a moment again ripe for vulnerable leadership, for transparency, for sharing of successes and of failures so that we can all come together and learn and grow together. And there are certainly things that we can do every day as leaders, big and small, Janice Omadecki, founder and CEO of the tech company, The Mentor Method, who also I say I would say has a terrific TEDx talk, outlines in this Harvard Business Review article some practical tips for how to lead by example as a vulnerable leader. Some of these are small, like just talking about when you're really worn out so that others realize that it's okay to sometimes be really worn out, or being explicit about carving out time for our own well-being. And some take more courage, like asking for help or speaking out to really uphold our values vocally in a meeting or otherwise. My own example of this is one time when I was trying to schedule a meeting and I said, well, I can't do that time because that's my regular therapy visit. And having somebody who was part of those conversations to get this meeting scheduled come to me a day or two later to say, you know, I've been thinking about going to therapy and you saying that made it seem like maybe that would be okay. Right, just authentically sharing a little piece of myself without a purpose necessarily other than just being open to sharing that. And my last vignette brings us full circle back to Dr. Tarbell. When I asked her successor about tell, to tell me something about how Nancy lived vulnerable leadership, she recounted to me that in many of their conversations, Nancy would share a funny story, maybe about a disastrous nanny or some frustration that she faced in her administrative roles and how she had navigated them. And by so doing, she left this mentee, her successor, the person she was leading with this takeaway, right? We're all juggling home and work. We all are facing the same challenges. We all are human. And so as we conclude, I'd love to invite you to consider your path ahead as a person, a teacher, a mentor, a leader. I would love it if you think about just one thing for yourself that you're gonna try out or take with you or just what's bubbling around in your head jot yourself a note about it. And I'll leave you with one final slide, my, some words from the greatest showman's song, This Is Me. I think this is a musical mantra for anyone who wants to practice vulnerability. I listened to it on my way into work today. And it's a reminder that each one of us is bruised but can be brave. When we show up authentically, we are in fact, as the song sings, glorious. So thank you all so much for having me. I'm so grateful for the incredible community here at MGH and for this opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas. I'm also would be incredibly grateful for your honest feedback. Um, and I think we might have time for questions, although I've lost a little track of the time. 
Thank you so much, Anne. This was really fantastic. Um, Nancy, if you would like to say a few words, you you get the mic. Thank you. I don't want to take much time because I, other people may have questions, but I have to thank you so much, Sharon. And that was just such a wonderful talk and talk about lifelong learning. I've actually never heard this topic discussed. And I feel as though I learned so much and in some way understand a lot more about what I have admired in other leaders and never heard it articulated about really their humility and vulnerability and the the things you talk about here. And I love that you bring that pediatric lens to everything and the stories and the books. I'm dying to go get some of those from my grandson that I haven't read yet. Um, so anyway, I was just blown away. Thank you for that broad uh, depth and breadth of coverage of such a, an important topic that so unique for many of us, maybe at a more senior spectrum. And it's so nice to see how everything has, you know, how things have evolved and changed over the years. So thank you so much for giving the lecture and thank you for letting oh, me Thank you here. so much. There are any questions? Uh, there is one in the chat, which I thought was uh, something that crossed my mind as well. Um, sometimes vulnerability equals um, weakness. And Kelly, version, can we speak about the fact that these risks will result sometimes in failure, but we are in a culture of perfection and litigation, so especially in the clinical realm. So any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to break out of that sense that we're stuck in a perfectionist model, right? Um, I think, you know, even around medical mistakes, we know that um, there used to be this thought that apology increased risk mm -hmm. of being sued, and that's not actually true. Um, I think the sense of um, shared decision making and sharing with our patients our own uncertainty, um, I think it was... Um, harder when I was earlier in practice because it hadn't been modeled well for me to kind of say to a family, gosh, I don't know, like I, you know, I'd run out of the room and look something up and now I'll say, you know, I'm not really sure about this. Like I'm going to pull up this um, reference or I'm going to like follow up with you after I um, read some more. So I definitely think that that's like the whole point is that in any way we're in which we're vulnerable, there is risk, but I think such um, uh, beautiful opportunities for growth. Um, but I think for our, our trainees, so they're living in a world where we keep perpetuating the sense of, of uh, perfection, um, we need to change something up to make it safe to be imperfect because we all are imperfect. Thank you. Um, Mimi Newman. Um, has Hi, Shannon. So nice to see you virtually again. And what a great talk. I um, I love this, and I I like to think that I try to do this. And you know, our um, our most recent CEO at Salem Hospital, Dave Roberts, ep epitomizes this kind of leadership, and I think he's been really inspirational and a mentor. My question has to do with struggling. I love the idea of mentoring differently, like like being able to bring the best out in people, and yet acknowledging that you know everyone's different and they need different things. My little struggle is when people aren't this it's hard and I I try to model it but it definitely makes me feel like I'm not trusted or they're you know they're not safe or secure and so I just don't know if you have anything more like directive on how to short of just modeling it right and trying to create that culture um, it's almost like a pride I think or like an ego thing with certain relationships these are professional relationships so I don't know if you can just say something about that yeah, I mean, I, and the last thing I want to be is Pollyanna, right? We work in one of the leading academic medical centers in the country, right? There's a certain, like, amount of, like, having to embrace that. Um, but I think it's often the little things we do. And, and I think you need to be smart, right? There's not, like, every moment about, like, sharing something that's really vulnerable. Because I think what you're getting at, Mimi, is that, like, maybe that other person hasn't created the space for you to kind of vulnerable vulnerably share. And so I think um, the more we do this, the more we create a culture of this. Um, just like that one study, right, it becomes more the norm. I don't think it is the norm right now, but I think we have a role to play in creating it as the norm um, and being willing to um, to use our positions of power to, to say this is who I am and I'm doing good work and I might look a little different than 
somebody else or do things a little differently, but it's not without risk. I totally agree with you. Great. Thank you, Shannon. I think you will have the last question. Okay. Shannon, thank you so much. Great talk and great TEDx talk too, as well. Um, and I guess my, my question is, I feel that we, we hear a lot of in the finance world or business world from my friends that are in that realm about vulnerability and leadership and compassionate leadership. And we hear so much about the needs in today's medical world, which may be best served by that type of leadership. But your talk is one of the first I've heard in medicine on this. So I just wanna know, do you feel the same thing? Like this is coming a little later to the forefront of medicine or, and, and I, do you think it should um, be the way? I will say that more of my references came from outside medicine than within medicine. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, I, I absolutely think that this is something that is critical to what we do do in patient care, right? Like it's so much, of, you know, we're, we're so much about compassion and humanity and, and kind of connecting with our patients. And yet I don't think it has necessarily been kind of the, the guiding light in leadership in medicine. That said, I think as, you know, a couple of the comments have, like you can immediately think about who does this, right? Um, and I think for me, it's been really helpful to name something that was, I think, how I wanted to lead. Um, I have to say, like, I never really liked the idea of servant leadership because all I could think of was the giving tree, which I don't know about you guys, but that's like a sad ending to me. There's the stump of a tree that just gave everything. Um, and I, so servant leadership was the closest, but then really when I kind of brought it I, more like thinking about vulnerability, it felt to me like a much better fit. Like I want to be that, um, which has a servant quality to it. But um, but I do think it's not happening here in medicine as much, but hopefully that'll change. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone. And Shannon, Scott Bernaglia, also Shannon McDonald. Thank you and thank you, Nancy, also for everything you have done for our faculty. And thank you all for attending and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.